coming and thank our guests. Uh, this is the in our Countdown to Brexit series. Um, we have an all British panel today. I think that's the first time we've, we've done that in the history of the Institute. I could be corrected on that. But uh, as I say, an all British panel to discuss uh, the future of the UK. As a foreign affairs think tank, we're naturally interested in what, how British society will evolve and what that, that will mean for how Britain is a neighbour and a partner um, bilaterally in Europe and how, how, how that thing's developed. Uh, we're going to try and avoid Brexit. Um, no, it'll come up. Try. 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 I know. I'm I'm not, not. For sanity, reasons nice for sanity. Uh, that won't work, of course, but I would urge people, if you have a question, maybe, and you, you know, toss it between a non-Brexit question and a Brexit question, go for the non-Brexit question then, um, to, to try to distract us from, from that, that issue. Um, so as I said, try to, try to look beyond the sort of blizzard of Brexit news and, and consider, consider where things it will be in the future. Each panelist will speak for about five minutes to, to introduce their thoughts. Uh, we may have a quick discussion and then we'll go out to you for your, your, your comments and your, your questions. Um, so let me introduce our, our three uh, speakers. We have Bill Emmett, who's the author of 13 books, the latest of which is uh, The Fate of the West. Uh, he's a regular contri contributor to publications all around the world. Uh, with opinion pieces, and uh, spent most of his career uh, at The Economist, where he was editor-in-chief for 13 years. Uh, Catherine Simpson uh, may sound Irish, uh, she spent a few years here, but uh, is indeed British. Um, she's senior lecturer in politi uh, political economy at Manchester Metropolitan University, and among other things, she specialises in public opinion and comparative European politics. She has uh, a couple of books coming out soon. Uh, Ella Whelan is an author, commentator and journalist. Uh, her latest, latest book is What Women Want, Fun, Freedom and an End to Feminism. And an end to feminism. Uh, she's a producer of London's annual Battle of Ideas Festival. Uh, she's written for many public publications, including The Economist, uh, and has until recently been the associate editor of Spike Online. Good. Uh, so maybe we'll go in reverse order uh, uh, to, the, to the way I've introduced and ask Ella to open. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm going to upset you greatly because I think we cannot have this discussion without talking about Brexit. There, so there I'm, afraid, <laughs> I'm afraid I refuse the, the beginning plea to not talk about it. And for one simple reason, and that's because uh, Brexit is not a policy question and it is not, um, cannot fit into one section of a manifesto. It cannot be fixed, done away with, uh, finished, completed. Brexit is a spirit, it's a demand, it's a, a push for change. I think it has to be looked at much more holistically uh, in order to understand it and understand where we would be in six years in 2025. I mean, they say 24 hours is a long time in politics, but I tell you, if the last two and a half, three years has meant anything, it's that this issue is not going away any time soon. And I'm glad of that, very glad of that. I'm a, uh, I think... Am I the only Brexit voter on the panel? I am the only Brexit voter on the panel. Uh, I'm one of those 17.4 million elusive uh, working class people that you only hear about on the telly if they're sort of been derided by politicians um, or talked down to by those who want to seem to be pro-Brexit. And I, I think I want to outline really what I think will happen in 2025 if we either have Brexit or if we don't. I think that's, gonna, that's sort of the important way to look at it. If you do enact Brexit, and my desire for that would be to go for a no deal on March 29th, because I think that's the only credible way of holding out democracy at this point. If you do see that vote through, then what you have is a really exciting prospect. You have an electorate who have turned out in the greatest <coughs> numbers, the British, biggest political mandate in British history. You have a really forceful, open sense of what politics can be. If that is realised, then we can have discussions about all kinds of things. And I think one of the important things is that it's very hard to place exactly what Britain would look like uh, in six years, even in one year's time. Because the point of what the drive of Brexit was about was uh, a desire for a complete shake-up. So the fact that neither Labour nor the Conservatives have managed to capture this Brexit spirit shows that those parties don't serve anymore. I mean, there's the turnouts in general elections before Brexit showed that no one is really massively <coughs> excited about the prospect of things carrying on as they are, whether it's the government's approach to immigration recently with the Windrush scandal and the outrage that that showed, it shows that the government's completely out of step in relation to that kind of domestic policy, 
think there's lots of questions that are open to say that people want something different. We were talking beforehand about the rise of minority governments and coalition governments, and that to me signals that politics as it stands at the moment just cannot hold. The status quo is no longer a doable thing. And for me, that's a very exciting prospect. <laughs> there's an, uh, recently in uh, British politics, I imagine you all watched the uh, rise and subsequent relative embarrassment of the independent group as they broke away from their uh, parties and decided to form this very vague notion of uh, centrism. And it was a really good indicator of, I think, where politics is going wrong at the moment, because uh, initially they had no demands, and they, when they were asked whether or not they had any demands for what kind of Britain they wanted, they said, that's the old way of doing politics. You know, that that's, doesn't hold anymore. Uh, and you kind of think, OK, so the new way of doing politics is to have no opinions, no ideas, no plan, uh, no manifesto. That kind of shows you, I think, uh, what Brexit was trying to challenge. So if Brexit does happen, it, the sky's the limit, in my point of view. You could have, you know, I've got some, and Spike has some very radical views about the kind of left-wing populism that could emerge and could transform people's lives uh, and, you know, uh, kick-start the economy in a different means of kind of progressive transformation. There's all sorts of things you could do. And with that challenge to the stage quo, that kind of genuine hope in politics is a very important force. If Brexit does not happen, and here I'm going to uh, not threaten, but warn, I think, a, a warning voice for the British political establishment. If Brexit does not happen, then what you are saying to the ordinary voter, um, whose only means of political engagement is putting an X in a box every four years or occasionally being asked to speak up in a referendum, what you're saying is that X in that box is worthless, meaningless. I'd be very surprised if anyone takes a general election seriously ever again. If you have politicians who've stood on manifestos promising to enact Brexit as they did in 2017 and going back on that as they now are, why, you know, they're not, their jobs aren't worth the paper that they're written on. Uh, it really will mean an end to democracy as it stands in Britain. And people have called me hysterical for saying that, but I think it's true. And certainly the feeling among the public is that, uh, you know, there was a Sky News poll came out last night when I was doing a talk that said, um, I think it was 97% of people think that the last two and a half years have been disastrous and that everything's gone wrong. And that's not a damning indictment on Brexit, that's a damning indictment on British politics and British politicians of which I think it's roughly 74% are pro-Remain. So you've got this sort of very exciting prospect for the future of British politics, for me. Uh, because on the one hand, you have a political establishment, an elite, that is so incredibly out of step <coughs> with the British populace. You know, anti-Brexit, anti-democracy, largely in their calls for second referendums or delays. And you've got a, a really exciting prospect for a new kind of politics to come up I would hope a left-wing politics that would galvanise and capitalise on the kind of uh, openness within the uh, British public's political desires. Then again, it could also go very wrong. And there are movements in, across Europe, whether it be uh, within Italy, within France, that shows that there is the threat of, of right-wing populism. So it's a kind of free time we're in, but there's openness for change. I think my main point, just to end on, is that uh, those who are arguing against Brexit, or even those who are arguing that Brexit is simply a policy position that can be put to bed um, once we either solve it with May's rubbish deal or some kind of extension and a fluffy means to it, uh, don't realise that this is a redefining of, I think, not just British politics, but European politics. It's a, it's a call for, making, for rejecting the status quo and doing something radically new. Uh, I think anyone who argues for the status quo or, or reactionary position politics now is in deep water because it just won't stand any longer. Thanks, Ellen. And I think that's an important perspective. I think of all the perspectives in Britain, uh, uh, a pro-Brexit left-wing one is the one that maybe we least hear in this country. So uh, interesting to get your views. Just a, a, a follow-up for later, maybe, that immediately comes to mind. Do, do you, is there a country or a political leader anywhere else in the world, I'm not asking you now, but that, that, you, you, you're, that you find inspiring from, from that perspective, maybe one we can follow up on? Um, Catherine. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a, a real delight to be here today, and I have to say it's probably one of the hardest panels I've had to put together looking at the UK in 2025, considering 
we really don't know what's happening in UK politics tomorrow, <laughs> never mind, uh, as I say, as far ahead as 2025. Uh, I'm going to make five points uh, looking kind of at, at the few, um, under that theme, um, and then I say, very happy to have uh, questions afterwards. I think the first point I'd like to make is that uh, calls for changes to the first past the post system uh, will, will probably happen. Um, Brexit was very much a mixture of long standing regional grievance about the EU. But in addition to people feeling disconnected and very angry about the political class, that type of disconnection uh, is quite common in Europe and the US. But in the UK, with the first past the post -sist voting system, there's not really an easy way uh, for voters to express their anger. Um, so the Brexit vote is very much evidence, uh, therefore, that something is wrong with the UK. It was an opportunity for people to have their voice heard. Um, and at some point, the electoral system will have to change. Uh, some would argue we've already had uh, a vote on that, the alternative vote uh, and referendum in 2011. But really, some type of almost radical devolution for England uh, is necessary. Um, government from the centre uh, is clearly not working, uh, especially for people in areas such as the northeast uh, and also the far southwest of England. Um, and that kind of radical devolution for uh, England would mix up the political class and you would get a very much, much more diverse background to that political class as well. Um, we know that immigration was a key issue for many people uh, in these communities uh, in the 2016 referendum. And I think there is a real need to distinguish between those that are, have been branded as racist or are racist, uh, those who feel they have real concerns over public services, uh, and those in particular uh, in the north of England who place emphasis on that sense of place and identity politics. Um, the current UK government, and I think future UK governments, uh, could do a lot more uh, to discuss immigration in a very grown-up and constructive manner that still really hasn't happened since uh, the referendum. The second point I would like to make is that the British political system is undergoing substantial change. Uh, some kind of nothing new in some respects, but British society has always been driven by class division. Uh, but since the 1980s under Thatcher, there is a feeling that has become stronger that political parties are not engaging with people who are not middle class and who don't live outside, or sorry, inside. Uh, the London bubble of the M25. Um, those people used to believe uh, that the Labour Party was listening and representing uh, them, but successive Labour leaders, I'm looking at Kinnock, I'm looking at Smith, Blair, created a Labour Party which was electorally successful, but not in touch with constituencies. Uh, and previously voters could forgive the Labour Party for this because they won elections but not anymore. Um, the economic and financial crisis of 2007 or 8 didn't really help. If you were close to the poverty line and suddenly everything gets more expensive and your wages stagnate, that will inevitably create more dis disaffection and dissatisfaction. But that is only one part of this story. Um, people have a genuine grievance with the UK political party system uh, which erodes and almost minimises um, people's voices. So UK political parties will look different. Um, and I think we're starting to see that now. The Conservatives will have to listen to the working class, not just the middle class. Um, and Labour will have to find a way through this to appeal to both the middle and working classes uh, as well. The third point I would like to make is that political party splits are unlikely. Um, the British electoral system favours established parties. Um, it's hard for new parties to develop because the UK electoral system is one, as I say, that uh, favours those established parties. And while UKIP have experienced you know, some electoral success, in particular in the 2014 European Parliament elections, that has never been translated to the national level. Um, that's because that first-past-the-post system favours those established political parties and it's difficult uh, to break through. I think what you will see is a continuation of divisions within uh, both parties becoming a lot more pronounced 
and becoming a lot more issue based uh, and really fracturing on those lines of remain and leave. I think for the Conservatives, uh, how much immigration and loss of sovereignty or vote is willing to accept is something that they, they really need to consider. But for Labour, I think they need to look at how comfortable voters are with immigration, the European Union overall, and the European single market. And do they need to try and get back voters from UKIP, from those left behind areas? Or are they really someone that the Conservatives need to be starting to get. And Catherine, just for time reasons, if you yeah. give us the two headlines for four and five. The fourth just and the fifth one. Yeah, just the fourth and fifth one. So I think Brexit has fueled distrust in politics. We'll come to that. That'll, we can again look at that. And I think towns are really key. We talk about regions. Towns are the keys, key in England for any political party. And I think that it's a much longer narrative as well about the decline of British politics in general. Fifth okay. and final one. Thank you. And the, the, your, your point about the radical devolution, just to say to people, Douglas Carswell, the, the UKIP MP, was, was originally agreed to speak but had to, had to pull out for, for uh, business reasons. Um, and people may recall that when he spoke here the last time, he was very much of that view uh, about radical devolution. Uh, so maybe we'll pick up on that, another important strand of thinking in Britain at the moment. We might pick up on that during the conversation. Bill. Thanks, Dan, and um, I'll uh, follow on with some fairly nitty-gritty, since I think a lot of the principles have been already uh, put out there, and I can always contribute on those over question, but I would just start with two points of principle. One is that I absolutely agree that 2008 is fundamental. I think that uh, we, uh, in any country, uh, in Western Europe or North America, we ignore the worst financial crisis for 80 years and the consequences that it's had for the people uh, at our peril. But we shouldn't think that this was, as it were, a deus ex machina that came from the outside. It was a consequence also of uh, um, a series of developments over the previous decade or more that are the background to uh, our issues. Second, I think a fundamental problem with Brexit as a, as a divider is, is, in addition to the thing that Ella said, was exemplified by the statistic that she produced, which is that 74% of uh, British parliamentarians are remain. They were elected in 2017 after Brexit. They were elected by parties who had a manifesto commitment, as you say, to deliver Brexit, but nevertheless, constituents elected people whose personal beliefs were different. Mm -hmm. So we've got a parliament that is the product of Brexit and yet is, as it were, not in favour of Brexit. So, it's, is, so Brexit is, a, is, is very hard to use as, as, as the right issue. Both parties are divided fundamentally, but over all sorts of issues, including particularly immigration, welfare, and security in the US. So what will the next five to 10 years uh, look like? I will take the assumption that Brexit happens one way or another. I won't bother with the no Brexit, but we can talk about it over questions. On the assumption that Brexit happens one way or another, I think, first of all, um, as uh, everyone in this institute knows very well, Brexit uh, won't have barely begun when we leave. It will be the beginning of both internal and external uh, negotiation of thought. Second, uh, because of all of the issues that will have to be negotiated externally with, the, with our trading partners in the European Union, but also internally. Because secondly, I do think that um, if Brexit, assuming Brexit does happen, within both parties there will be, in effect, a battle for true Brexit. The real divide of politics will become how to make the best of Brexit, uh, and the battle within and between the parties will be fundamentally shaped by that for at least quite a, a few years. On the, on the right, that will mean a battle to, as it were, uh, express Brexit through more free trade, deregulation, um, and any tax cutting opportunities that can be had to, uh, to add to it. On the left, it will be much more about uh, state intervention, nationalization, and, uh, uh, and other issues. But in either direction, you would have, I think, um, a battle to define true Brexit. Um, secondly, though, if we look at that as being a, a fuel forecast about the politics of Britain and Europe, I think that that means that we will sail away further in, as far as we can from the European Union, but then gradually sail back, not to rejoin, but rather because actually the, the politics will come onto a different lot of issues, especially because I think the next fundamental issue that a Brexit assumption brings on is the future of the United Kingdom itself. Uh, that we can't uh, ignore. Um, if Brexit happens, 
there's absolutely going to be pressure for a, a, re a new independence referendum in Scotland. There will absolutely then be an attempt to get a border poll um, in the north. Uh, and I don't want to predict what either will produce, but if you think that either part of those constitu constituent parts of the United Kingdom might uh, secede, then you change all the arithmetic of British politics uh, and of Westminster. So, and you change the kind of some of the identity issues about England, and you change the issues about devolution. You also then lob into this the question of coalitions. Um, until the 2015 election, uh, on the basis of, of the, all the previous four or five elections, it was fair to say that the British <coughs> party system was fragmenting and that the, the, the result of the two major parties was declining election after election. That was then reversed in, 20, in, in 2017, uh, and we suddenly got a, a two-party system. I would just count, disagree with Catherine to say, I don't think it's impossible for a third party to break through. It's very difficult. I think uh, at the risk of being un unacademic with a counterfactual, I think the SDP might have broken through if the Falklands War hadn't happened. Um, but nevertheless, the Falklands War did happen. <laughs> um, but, so it's very difficult, but I think it could happen in some circumstances. But then also, uh, we are likely to get into coalition. Final point, um, I think that the framing issue because of the 2008 and the consequences and all the background to this is going to be, as in also many countries, including this one, the battle between like public um, squalor and private affluence, named inequality, but also about the ability of the public finances to afford the services, the public services that people want to vote for. Uh, and that will be with a longer term uh, definition of politics. Thank you, Bill. Uh, just a, a thought, was, was 2008 the most, the, the defining event of the happening of the 21st century so far? Was it 9-11? Was it the election of Trump? Was it the referendum? Uh, well, maybe just... Do you want me to answer straight away? Uh, Trump, Trump was a consequence. I don't think he's... Well, it depends what he does, but I don't think he's the defining... I, do, I think that clearly 9-11 and then the Iraq War in, in international affairs and then 2008 have to be seen as the defining events uh, in my view but they are connected to some extent mm. in that I think that the 9-11 and, and uh, the Iraq war in my view led to an attitude to regulation and, um, and monetary policy in the United States that helped the credit bubble to inflate mm. and led to as it were a, a, a benign neglect position that produced the excesses that led to that in my view. Interesting. And I'll come to Ella on the, the point about the, uh, possible inspiration. You could indicate that you have uh, an interest in making uh, making a point or having a question. We've got one already. Uh, but Ella, any thoughts on um, models for the UK? Any 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 people parties that you admire? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> but um, but one thing that I have been watching with interest and uh, okay, uh, an occasion expressing solidarity with has been the Gilets Jaunes movement not because it's not without its flaws, but I think there's something really interesting happening within that uh, uprising, because there's, if you look at what the, the kind of the, the problem they have at the moment is it's a leaderless movement, and it's a decidedly leaderless movement, which has uh, contradictory claims. So it wants to have bigger public spending, but lower taxes is something that, and everyone says, well, how are you going to do that? But part of, the, part of that challenge is it's directly a challenge that says, well, the way that the current kind of compromise of politics where you have to give a little, take a little all the time doesn't work for them anymore. The fact that any leader that tries to uh, speak for them, whether it be some members of Moon the Pens Party or others, uh, haven't managed to encapsulate what it stands for. And some people see that as it just being a kind of mob. I see that actually as it, again, being a challenge to uh, come up with a new way of politics. I think that's the thing that across um, Europe, it's not a uniquely... British problem, I think, is that there's sort of a feeling of stagnation uh, in the way in which people engage with politics and nothing really changes. Kind of what I write on Spike about a kind of technocratic approach, in which everything is about maintaining a status quo, balancing the books, never rocking the boat. And, uh, you know, th I just think that people have for so long have been sort of di disillusioned by that and even apathetic. But the inspiration of the kind of gutsiness of Brexit, I think, has opened up a space where you could rock the boat and see what happens. Maybe to both of you and Catherine here, is the status quo a bit like health? You only miss it when you don't have it. And that maybe not having the status quo and 
causing rupture uh, could end up unleashing things that are damaging. And you know, do you think, for example, the British could could emulate the Gilets Jaunes movement? I, I lived in the UK at the time of the fuel protests, mm -hmm. and nobody saw it coming. It came out of mm -hmm. the blue. It almost shut the country down. Mm -hmm. It's actually quite a frightening moment. You, you may be too too young to remember it, but it, it was you know. British do protest at times. Mm. You know, is is it possible that things will go that way, particularly if, if Brexit doesn't happen, for example? Will the 17.4, will, will there be a, a, an activist movement, a, a more protest movement? Do you see things turning in that direction? Oh, I just it was quickly, uh, I hope, I hope, and that would be, <laughs> if it did happen that I would be out on the streets with them, I got into a huge amount of trouble for saying that on BBC Radio 4 on, on a Sunday morning a few weeks ago and, and said I was inciting um, an uprising. But the, the fact is British politics is different. I mean, the French come out of the drop of a hat and I'm not trying to do them down for that. But uh, I think the interesting thing about the status quo is that if you look at pre-Brexit, uh, in terms of economics, I mean, the status quo was dire. I mean, it wasn't so long ago that we were all rowing about austerity. Yeah. I mean, the situation for your average working person in, in uh, England is, is crap. If you, if there's, even if you are in a job, it's a low-valued job, it's you know, precarious work, and you've got no, uh, no uh, opportunity to improve your quality of life. It's kind of stagnant. And so I think the interesting thing, or the depressing thing, is that the anti-Brexit crowd are asking us to stay at that point, to deal with that, to just suck up that status quo. And I think that's an incredibly unreasonable demand to put on people. Yeah, just on that, I think, um, again, you know, pre-Brexit, the, the status quo was really bad, and, and in some respects, nothing uh, has changed kind of post-Brexit, post post-2016. This is the, the issues about inequality and economic insecurity are still there and the precarious nature of employment. Um, and again, you know, in the UK, it's, it's not like other European countries where you know, as I say, in France, that you know, strikes are very prevalent. We, that is, just does not happen in the UK. And I also think that the three-year period of post-Brexit has also been a missed opportunity as well, because it hasn't really rallied people around it. The kind of the general consensus among the public now is, well, let's just get on with it. Um, and you think, well, well, what is it that you want us to get on with? You know, on almost echoing the kind of indecisive nature of, of Parliament as well. So I, I think as well that you know. It, it has the potential to fundamentally change things but hasn't really done so yet um, and you know there's no indication that it will come next week or the coming months. Okay good uh, we've got a bunch already but Donald you were first up. I thought that the purpose of this seminar was to project what might happen in a couple of years time so I'm going to take up on what some of you have said. Uh, in in uh, six or seven years time there will be a completely new electoral system in Britain. It will be proportional representation in some shape or form. Secondly, another thing that will happen is that uh, eventually, I know, pretty soon, uh, you guys in Britain will suddenly realize the emergence of what Lord Turnbull, the former cabinet secretary, said, that you need a separation of powers between the executive and the legislature. And so what you will have is you will have a proportional electoral system. You will be electing the executive separately to the uh, electoral system. There will be a real separation of powers, maybe not on the American model. And um, the advantages of this is that it will allow new parties to grow. Take, for example, UKIP got how many, what proportion of, of the electorate in, in a recent election, and they didn't get, they got one seat in Parliament. Absolutely outrageous. By the way, lest you think that that's a great idea, I, I think that that will happen, but it depends on you guys, and I'm assuming that what Brexit represents, which is what I'm taking from Ella, is that a major cultural shift has already happened. They don't get it in the political parties, either Tory or Labour. They don't get it in the academics. Sorry, uh, Catherine, you do, uh, but you don't see it in other, in other, other uh, commentary. The effect here is that, for example, we haven't re-elected, we've only re-elected an outgoing government once in the last 50 years, only once. The last major one-party government was a disaster in the 70s because it did not respond to uh, the crisis of the oil crisis, and it gave rise to a depression in the 80s. Uh, the, um, uh, we've had two major crises, uh, since that, and the last government that was re-elected was in 2004 or 2002, 
And it too was a disaster because it didn't stop the Celtic craziness. The result is that we have the highest per capita debt in the Eurozone and the third highest uh, in, the, uh, in the world after Japan <coughs> and the States. No, don't long so I, I ask you, so if you be careful what you wish for is what I'm saying. <laughs> okay, Tom. Um, just one thing that um, I, I thought you might, one of you might refer to uh, was social media and mm. its impact uh, now. Um, and bearing in mind the continuing growth of inequality since the Great Recession, which has stirred so many uh, feelings. But now, uh, if the but politicians are not expressing the interests and concerns of their constituents, the constituents have a means to communicate and build up pressure. Uh, but it, it manifested itself in the States with Trump because they deliberately um, manipulated it. it uh, with Cambridge Analytica, it had a very decisive impact, the decisive impact, I think, mm -hmm. on the referendum. and. Uh, what you have there is a very right wing group being supported <coughs> here by elected centre <laughs> person, which I find quite uh, uh, interesting. And um, at, at the same time, I think uh, uh, you have avoided completely the economic consequences of Brexit. And we have studied it quite a lot, it will have very significant adverse impacts here in Ireland and very significant adverse impacts in the UK. And that surely has to be factored into, if you assume Brexit happens, uh, what Britain's going to look like in 2025. And those people who gave their one comment when they put the X on the ballot paper are not going to thank a lot of people, which is why professional politicians are desperately trying to get out from under uh, what they have been applied to. I think that was aimed at you mostly, Ella, and maybe you could elaborate on where you see the big opportunities. You were saying that the, the policies, I think you call them populist left policies, could be introduced that could really change people's lives. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you, you, you'd come back on that and build the, the issue of uh, social media. How do you think British politics has been affected by social media and how do you think it will be affected you know, over the next 2025? Is, is, there, is it a big... Well, I think, I mean, on that question, I think everybody's politics is now so dominated by and affected by social media. It didn't exist 10 years ago, essentially. It exists now. Uh, it's a reality of life. Secondly, uh, it's alongside a situation in which, thanks to uh, the 2008 financial crisis and the debt issues that have, that have restricted the perceived range of options that governments have had, we can argue about whether that was the right perception, but the perceived range of options... Um, Currently, thanks to social media, people are running on personality and ideas and not on policy. Uh, that, if, that's what all the Democratic candidates in the United States are basically, except Elizabeth Warren, are ignoring policy and it's all about personality and about ideas and, and um, uh, rejecting the status quo and so forth. Uh, and that is just populism put into a modern context. Um, populism is a reaction to a failure to deliver in, conven in conventional <laughs> forms and to try to elect. Now, if you, you can be elected uh, predicting rupture and demanding rupture with the status quo, you then actually have to deliver that. So we've seen a succession of people who've said that they're going to be delivering rupture in, in uh, Parliament, in elections, and then have failed to deliver. Uh, Nicolas Sarkozy from the right, um, they, uh, all sorts of other people. So then the question is whether you deliver. So I think social media is very important, but it's, a, it's, it's just a reality of life now and how you market and how you, how you deal with things. It makes perhaps other voices a bit wider. Did you want to come in on that particular? Just a very, very small point about social media. I, again, I agree with Bill, it's a, it's a part of, of daily life now. And I think if you're any political party, you have to embrace it and you have to have a social media strategy. It's as simple as that. But there is a big difference as well um, between the type of social media so Twitter is very much seen, and has, there's been a lot of analysis uh, and academic research around this, in particular by Rob Ford, by Rachel Gibson. Twitter is seen very much as the elite. 
Facebook is seen very much as kind of the grassroots. There is a big difference between yeah. the types of social media that is used and how they are used as well to galvanise uh, and to kind of uh, tran kind of transmit a message as well. And so is that UK specific or everywhere? That's across yeah, the board. Yeah, so the UK is no exception to that rule. But <coughs> there's, you have to be very, very kind of careful, I think, as well, when you talk about social media, what type of social media you're talking about um, and how you're targeting okay. uh, in that as well. Ella, that, that mm -hmm. point made there that you know, most mainstream economists, and I know you were, you were on a panel last night with somebody maybe not part of that group, but most mainstream economists think that if you put up barriers to trade, you'll reduce activity and there will be a, there will be a negative effect you 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 well you, you may not agree with that but certainly that issue that you raised in your in your opening remarks about the opportunities of mm. populist left politics you might just elaborate on, on well hands in the air i'm not an economist uh, and your point about you having studying it and me not is probably very true in the terms that i've not made a career out of um uh, examining or freaking out about the kind of scaremongering about the post-brexit economy but I think one thing that you have to remember is that everything that we were talking about now, we have heard already in 2016. I mean, even to a greater extent, during the referendum campaign, uh, all of big business, all of the political establishment uh, were coming down and saying that this would bring economic catastrophe, that the pound would absolutely plummet, that we'd all be out on our ears, that we'd have no food did, left. The pound did plummet, and the mm -hmm. forecast would turn out to be accurate. Yeah, well, <laughs> but, every, but, the, but the point is, but the, uh, well, laugh Perhaps if you like, but the point but is, the point is, the point they is that wrong. people still voted for it. I yeah. think that's the thing that you forget, is that people said, the people who are that, supposedly... That, that, okay, that absolutely fair point, but look, let's, let's project for... No, I yeah. definitely didn't yeah. want to get into re, 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 refighting the referendum, but just in terms oh, of... It, it's being refined. I know, I, I, yeah. let's try and just bring it away from that and just look at what, you know, for example, if Jeremy Corbyn were elected, I know you're not a, a fan, but you know, just in terms of what you think could happen mm -hmm. in the future if the kind of policies that, that you favour... How, what are those policies? Can you just some idea around that and, and how could they uh, change things for the better in Britain? Okay, well, I, Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party want to stay in a customs union or some kind of customs union, if it's the customs union, so I don't think that would enact any kind of meaningful change. I sign up to uh, a, left, a kind of left-wing populist economic progressive policy from the economist Phil Mullen from Northern Ireland, um, who wrote a book called Creative Destruction, where he talked about the fact that you need to uh, deal with the underlying issue of the economy, which is the lack of production. So actually his point is, and my point is, that Brexit will neither be the magic pill nor the death knell of the British economy, because its problems are so much deeper. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the, the point is that Brexit allows you to break the deadlock of not only political stagnation, but also economic stagnation. I mean, I, you're better off reading his book, it's called Creative Destruction, than me summarising it um, here. But what he says is that we should enact on a, a very strong kind of bottom-up policy of, uh, it's, he's got three S's, stop, start and sponsor, where you cut away all failing businesses and you let them go to the wall. You restart innovation and really kind of pump money into getting us more productive again. And you sponsor people through that progress. So it's a really kind of... It's a, it's a bottom-up and challenging radical view of completely reshaping the economy. And uh, people rolled their eyes at me, and certainly I spoke at Coots last night. They certainly did, you know, did not know where the hell I was coming from when I was sat in the main foyer of Coots talking about it. But it it's reflects, I think, the, uh, the aspiration for big ideas and blue-sky thinking and saying that actually the way things are going at the moment, which is just a means to keep things ticking over and ticking over quite badly, just will not do anything. Okay, Phil Mullins, not a name. I, I don't know if many people have heard uh, of him, but maybe, maybe who knows? We could invite him, uh, particularly in Northern. Oh yeah, he'd love um, that. Colin, we're next. Uh, Colin Raptor, uh, two brief questions. The media have not served the British public extremely well over the last couple of years. Do you think that situation will improve by 2025? And given that there may or may not be a referendum in Scottish independence, which may fail, what do you see as the role of the SNP? The next few years, as we said, this is because I quite struck by what's been said about third parties. When the SNP is a third party, yeah. so mm -hmm. how do you see the SNP role in the UK context? Thank you. Um, yeah, I can, I can uh, jump in on that. Um, we were talking about this uh, downstairs actually, and the, the role of the media. And I, I'm fortunate enough to do quite a lot of media work, um, probably because I live in striking distance of Media City. But um, the fact is, I think you're you're right that there was a real, in particular in the 2016 referendum campaign. Um, and the BBC have come under heavy criticism for it about the inability to distinguish between impartial and being balanced. 
Uh, and I think that's starting to maybe shift a little bit now. Um, I've done some recent research on um, the influence of the tabloid press, which, let's be honest, is, is kind of a hallmark of, of the UK and UK politics. Um, and I think there's serious questions as well there to be, to be asked around the narrative. Can they better serve um, the British public? And I think that's kind of social media, traditional media and newspapers. Um, I, I think they have a duty to, but it's, it's difficult to see that at the moment. Uh, in terms of the role of the SNP, a very, very small point because I'll, I'll pass over to, to Bill. But, um, you know, this was a, a question on everybody's mind straight after the referendum about, it, you know, Indy Ref 2. Current polling for a second independence referendum is, is kind of 43%. It's fallen through the floor. Um, and the SNP in the last general election did not poll as well and lost seats substantially. So any general election coming up, the SNP really do need to kind of construct themselves around the narrative. And the narrative that they have chosen is one to be kind of very pro-European so far, which is appealing to a certain aspect of their base, but not all, because there's a, a big base of the SNP that fall into that in a, in a economic insecurity, precarious, left behind, um, kind of populist as well. So they are in a, a precarious scenario. So when I talk about, you know, people get very excited about a potential, potential general election to break this deadlock, all political parties are up against this because Brexit has fractured politi political parties internally on remain and leave lines. Well, media are just mainly connect back to the social media question. I mean, the media has fragmented. The media has changed. The media is no longer a small group of, of, of uh, newspaper editors sitting in Fleet Street um, deciding whether, whether uh, people rise and fall. Uh, and that it will continue to change over the next five to 10 years. So if you say, what's the media position going to be in 2025? I'd say newspapers will have their readership uh, continue to decline. Um, those newspapers that, that, that are still there, um, whether online or <coughs> they're obviously all, or they're all digital, uh, will basically then tailor their political position according to the to the environment that they're in, either for or against where it is. So, uh, uh, in terms of shaping the position, they will be even more politicised in the future, I think, because they're fighting for their survival, and taking the Fox News approach on left or right will become re of a renewed interest. Uh, but media have become less influential because of social media, which distributes it all around. SNP, I agree actually with Catherine that I think we've seen peak SNP for the moment. Um, they are in decline, partly because they've been in government in Scotland for quite, quite a long time now. Um, and Alex Salmond um, you know, couldn't happen to a nicer man. Um, uh, uh, and, uh, and that has, I think, damaged him at the party as well, because obviously he, he was very much their, their symbol. Uh, so uh, they've, got, they've got a way to go in terms of getting back their grip. But if they decline to 30 seats, they could still be the kingmaker in a future general election. There are 56 or something? Yeah, yeah 56, even after um, that. So they could still be the kingmaker, and then they could. But it all depends on what the situation is with regard to Europe, Brexit, po alternative policies, and so forth. Some of the approaches that uh, Ella uh, outlines could be popular in Scotland. And the SNP has actually a left-wing <coughs> background about them, by the way. Mr. Mullins' ideas sound neoliberal to me, but nevertheless, we'll, in other words, they sound like Hayek might agree with them. But that we, we, we might talk about that uh, at another event. I think it's very interesting. Indeed, absolutely, absolutely. Yes. Good. Uh, Martin, you were next. Um, my question is actually about uh, 2025, and that's the state of immigration in 2025. Um, now, clearly, this was an issue that was uh, a driving factor behind the referendum. Uh, the one relative I have in England who is from the Indian uh, subcontinent. Um, he voted for Brexit on the mm. grounds that there would be less immigrants from Eastern Europe and more from his part of the world. Um, now, there does seem to be some evidence at the moment uh, that while uh, immigration from Eastern Europe and indeed from the EU general is right down, uh, it is rising sharply from other parts of the world. Now, is it the case that actually the anti-immigration thing is a little bit like um, King Canute and the Tide, that, uh, that, the, that the British economy is going to continue to need immigration, and that people will find in 2025 uh, that while the composition of immigration may be different, um, uh, uh, nothing else will have changed. Uh, Ella, 
you want to just pick up on, I don't think you mentioned the, the, your views on immigration and how important it is as a driver of politics. Mm -hmm. Any I think it, it's, uh, I mean, it wasn't the top reason why people voted for Brexit, but it was certainly very important. I think it's important to distinguish between the problem with the discussion about immigration in the UK has been that any discussion of it has been labelled uh, quite quickly as either having roots in some kind of xenophobia or a bigoted outlook. Uh, and rather than uh, make people more progressive in relation to their approaches to immigration, I think that's deepened a kind of resentment among people, which is certainly not uh, where we should be going. Uh, I personally am perhaps one of the... Uh, uh, an unusual Brexiteer and that spiked up... Uh, repeatedly and has always argued for a open approach to immigration post-Brexit. But I think the important thing is that <coughs> that discussion is very much up the grabs. And uh, Petra mentioned in her opening speech about the fact that people uh, interpret or see their approach to things like immigration very much in relation to a complex range of issues. So it's simply not just about hating the person who's from a different country next to you. It's about means of access to the society's resources. Uh, I think one very interesting thing to note, and uh, it's just as an example that I often use to kind of pose this, is that UKIP, um, as someone mentioned before, was fantastically popular in the run-up to the referendum, during the referendum, it was in the millions that it's votes, and then that tanked mm -hmm. post-referendum to, I think it's 500,000 or something like that, which showed that this narrative of Brexit being just about kind of a hatred of foreigners or an isolationist approach did not stand up. I mean, also in relation to the Windrush scandal that happened recently in the UK, uh, people were polled on what, how they felt about the British government essentially creating a hostile environment for black people, and they were appalled by it. And actually, the people who were most appalled by it were in the over 65s and above, so your classic Brexit voter. So I think the whole thing is that immigration often, often gets used as a stick to beat Brexit with. It's this kind of very negative thing. What doesn't get heard is the fact that the EU's own approach to immigration is, I think, despicable. I mean, Fortress Europe has meant that people are dying in the sea. Uh, the kind of corrupt uh, trading of people that's happening in Libya is, you could argue, a direct result of the kind of immigration policy that the EU has. So by all accounts, we need to have a big discussion about immigration. I will be the kind of person that's arguing for a pro and open one. And I don't think that's as unlikely as people make it out to be. Okay. Bill, any well, I, 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 I mean, I rather, I rather agree with what Ella said on, on, on that. I think that it, it, it's a complex issue. It's always toxic, as it were, for different reasons within politics, and very rarely, therefore, gets a proper um, assessment, actually. Uh, I don't think in 2025 Britain will be a closed country to immigration. Uh, whether it has more or less than X or Y, who knows? But I don't think we're suddenly going to close the doors. Good. Gentleman here. Stephen Allen Ulster Bank. Um, first half, I mean, it's quite working for a bank. I'm delighted to be better here because the forces of creative destruction challenging institutes like this and challenging audiences like this. Uh, I'm delighted that we're, we're, we're having this discussion. My question is more that that populist left you're talking about, how they organise themselves? I mean, I'm not talking about like all the socialists and social democratic parties, the technocrats took them over, sucked the life out of them, made us all apathetic. I'm not endorsing going back to that model. But the great socialist parties of the mid 20th century, let's say <coughs> athletes go into that, they did have to be organized to make the changes and implement the idea. <coughs> and that's where <coughs> there seems to be a gap. And I think in the Yellow Vest, I think of that footage of, uh, in, uh, I think it was Leon, Yellow Vest beating the head off one another on the street, got somewhere on the far left and somewhere on the far right. And that's my question. You've, you've stated the problem, problem uh, hopes, but I just don't see how that populist left organises itself. Mm. And what do you think? Mm. Clearly for you. Yeah. Um, I mean, and I, I'm glad you asked the question because here then you have to admit the fact that, especially in the UK, um, working class consciousness or a kind of sense of political organisation among the working class is at its lowest point ever. I mean, that's part of the problem in relation to organising around the Brexit vote is that you have had decades of not only the disillusionment of the working class, but the degradation of the working class. And we were talking about identity mm -hmm. politics earlier. I mean, the one thing that it's considered scum to be today is working class. I mean, whether it be about discussions about the media influencing us with, uh, you know, us idiots who all we did was read a sign on a bus and then we voted, or Cambridge Analytica wonks, you know, control our minds. It is, there's been a real, uh, real attack 
on the working class in the UK. And that has meant that, you know, I, I, I am depressed at saying this, but the march on the 23rd, this Saturday, for a people's vote is going to be giant. I, I'm pretty sure of that. And the march representing the 17.4 million people who voted in the referendum for the Brexit vote, I don't think will be as large. And that's not because people don't care and people don't want change, but because there's this sense of it being very difficult to organise. So I have no easy answer for you. But I think the important thing is that and, you know, the, the option is to continue to argue for something. And you're very right about the problems within the gilets jaunes, for example, because you know, at some point they are going to have to coalesce and say, well, what is it that you actually want? You can't just continue to go smashing up things. That sort of thing isn't, isn't going to work. But uh, it has, the thing that comes around to organise, it has to be uh, right, not right wing, but it has, to be, it has to find a right kind of new way. And any kind of attempt to clamp down or reshape this through old party means, I mean, the Labour Party has tried to say that it's for the many, not the few, mm. which is utterly bizarre given the fact that it is campaigning against the many in the interests of the few in relation to its anti-Brexit stance. So, you know, class politics or left-wing politics, the left is dead in the UK, and I'm, I'm not saying that with relish, but... You know, that doesn't mean that there's not ground for something different to happen. Actually, as it happens, I think it's very unhelpful to talk about left or right anymore. I think it's really the case now is whether you are a Democrat or anti-Democrat, Brexit has completely redefined any kind of political side. Okay, we've got loads of questions and only about eight minutes. I'm going to take two here. Peter. Uh, thanks, Peter. Thank you. Uh, could I ask the panel to speculate on um, Britain in the world in 2025, um, whether it will have perhaps recovered uh, some of the influence that seems to have squandered over the past couple of years, and what would be the, uh, the main characteristics of its external commercial policy, free trading outlook, or, uh, and of its defence and, and foreign policies, relations with China, Russia, the US, human rights, and so on. We've only got eight minutes. Um, <laughs> uh, quick. Um, I'm a member of the Institute. Can I ask the panel for your views on how important the parameter of class is now vis-a-vis -vis 2025 and where you see it going, and particularly given the changing nature of work, how you see the self-identification of working class changing, what is it going to be the same? Well, Catherine, maybe start with you on this one. Okay. On either one of them. Um, or both. I will, uh, I will start with the last one first, if that's all right. Uh, the importance of class, I mean, I'm, I slightly disagree with Ella on her point of we don't really, we shouldn't identify now as kind of left and right, um, there's been quite a lot of analysis in the last week or two by the UK and Changing Europe saying that while Brexit has kind of fractured that, it is still really important for politics and it, it's not really going anywhere soon. And that's linked to the points I've made about the first past the post uh, system and the electoral system that we have in the UK. So I think class is still going to be really, really important. But the problem is, is that the kind of old traditional definitions of class are starting to waver and we've really seen this kind of since the 1980s where you know you look at a, a policy like the, you know Margaret Thatcher introduced about buying your council house and all, everyone's moving from working class to middle class and we're all middle class now type thing uh, and that's that trend is, is continuing um, but I think really in a, in a post Brexit in, environment you know kind of in 2025 um, we will see a redefinition of, of class and what that what it means to be that and political parties need to kind of understand what they mean and how they identify with their voters in that way. Bill, Britain 2025, trade and security. Uh, <coughs> I think uh, Britain will be a diminished power in the world in both the trade and security in 2025. I'd be a bit more optimistic about 2035 in the sense that I think that uh, because we will be going through a, uh, a, lot, of adjust a lot of change in the next uh, five, to five to seven years, uh, I don't think that we will also have governments that will focus on um, emphasize on, on building a, a, an influential role in either trade or security in that period because they'll be too disrupt, uh, distracted by other things and their resources will be going in those other directions. Uh, so I think that inevitably we will be a diminished uh, force in both areas. Okay, three more and LEU first dibs on, on, on this champion. Bill, uh, 2025 uh, UK, uh, economically, commercially, pound, and unemployment. What picture do you see? Thanks for it being succinct. Thank you, thank you, Logan. Uh, rupturing the status quo is not a destination, as you uh, acknowledge yourself with uh, Gilles Jean. Um, so, 
uh, where is that destination? And Bill raised the issue of how austerity had come in after 2008. And I'd say to uh, Ella, enjoy your notoriety because you have, uh, what you're saying is almost irresponsible. Uh, they already, uh, the uh, insecure uh, on income have already, and your concern for them is touching, but at the same time, we're about to see, and experts are saying, and don't give me gold slack, forget about experts, experts right across are saying that Brexit will mean 900 to 1,000 pounds less uh, 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 head of population in the UK. Uh, now, I, I just make one point that that may be uh, pocket money to Rhys Morgan as ill, but that's 10% of the salary of someone living in the northeast of England. So I don't know how you, from the left you can say that that loss of money is worth uh, imposing on the uh, marginalised in society uh, for the next uh, five years, what the period you're looking <coughs> at. Brian. Uh, very briefly, um, I, I was going to make a question very similar to the one before last, um, but one small point, 17.4 gets mentioned a lot, and uh, well, I think you mentioned actually the, big, uh, the biggest mandate in British history. Um, I think there was 17.4 million people actually just factually voted to join the European Union mm. in 1973, which actually represented mm. a two to one majority of the time, of people who voted, and 30% of the population. 17.4 today represented 52%, uh, 26%. So just, it is important probably just to remember some of the facts. <coughs> I think it goes to one of the earlier points around the system and the first past the post mentality has, an, you know, arguably created this dynamic that kind of winner takes all. Mm -hmm. uh, which I think for a country that historically has been so balanced in many ways and history, um, UK in 2025 perhaps might necessarily be as balanced as the sense I have that maybe that's a part of the question. But okay, so Ella, I'm sure you, you might want to pick up on that one there. Yeah, so the people who are most likely to vote Brexit were those who are in so social housing, no formal education, and earning under £1,200 a year. And, uh, you know, although it's very hard for some people to wrap their heads around, uh, the people who are at that economic stage, or the working class, or those who are working but just about managing, uh, can think beyond their pockets. And I think one of the most inspiring for me, it parts of the, as someone on the left, parts of the Brexit vote was that it was saying that actually the political demands of people's engagement in society, their sense of control over politics, their democratic demands, is <coughs> paramount. And that means, that for me, that's a really exciting thing. That means you have a populace that wants to grasp the nettle of change and make something about it. I think it's, it's the, the question that was asked about class um, in the earlier round is very interesting because uh, I think that Brexit has become, even though that class is different uh, today than it was in relation to uh, other historical events like the miners' strike, we're in a very mm -hmm. different context. But if you take what is happening in relation to you have a mass public vote of which large numbers of it are of working class. I mean, Labour's it was you know they have huge constituencies in the north that are working class areas that vote for Brexit, and you have a parliament <coughs> or a political establishment that is so viciously against that. I mean, that seventy four percent of MPs voted Remain, but currently the current state of Parliament is that you have warring camps arguing over how best to scupper via a second referendum or a delay or a really you know, bad deal that no one wants, how best to scupper Brexit. So you've got this, for those of us who are watching at home, it's a really clear distinction that says that there is us and there is them, and it's them that are controlling it. I think a really important thing to note is that after the, you know, almost immediately after the referendum result was announced, that political demand was taken away from us and shut into the closed doors of Westminster. I mean, it's remarkable that 650 people have determined how this is going to be to happen for the last two and a half years. It's unbelievable that they are having you know, votes and amendments in Parliament that is just directly going against what we voted for. I mean, I, I debated Stella Creasy, a Labour MP, last night, who got up on a podium and said, we have to stop Brexit. I mean, that means we have to stop a democratic vote. So in terms of what that means for people's sense of themselves, I'm telling you now, you would be very, if I, it'd be very hard pressed to find a person who would have any belief in politics, any kind of ordinary voter, if they have voted for something that gets diminished, and then elected people on manifesto pledges that promise that vote and that gets diminished. What would you do other than, you know, there's two options. If you kind of take to the streets in protest, which I hope people will do to make their democratic demands realise, 
or you never engage in politics again. Mm. So either way, it doesn't look good for the political establishment to go back on this. We've already gone over time. Bill, you had a specific question there, and Catherine, I'll come to you to a very yep. final. Okay, well, first of all, I'd say the third alternative is you, you are asked again in a referendum. Uh, so that the reason why there will be hundreds which is of thousands... Which is not a do-over. It's an asking the pe it's giving the people a, a chance to vote. Again. Yes. What? I, you I mean, mean a your, your really view nice. of democracy is vote once. If it's a referendum, if, no, if we have be. a second referendum, it is a do-over. It's not a do-over. That's the point. We're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're never going to agree on that. We're never going to agree on that. People have the, the point of democracy and representative government is that you have the chance to change your mind. You are saying people should Once never... Once the vote is happened. Once the vote happens. Until Brexit has happened, any second referendum would remain on the ballot paper is a delegitimisation of that first vote, which is anti-democratic. No, it's a and rethinking of that vote by the people. So, anyway, I'll go on to the answer to your question. Um, the answer is it all depends on the policies that people operate. I mean, in other words, there are too many variables to do this. The absurdity of the scaremongering was that it was based on a 2030... Um, Project projection, which had to say other things equal these changes, because nothing will else will change. These changes in Britain's status in the European Union will have the following effect on people's incomes. <coughs> it was a nonsense. You can't do that. Everything else can change. So the debate that we've that we've been having and that politics will have about what policies to follow, uh, whether on the left or on the right after Brexit, are what will determine the answer to your question. Uh, and unless you know the answer to the question about what policies will be offered, I can't answer your question about well, unemployment, the market, let alone... What is uh, uh, Don Keane's <coughs> great reference to Mr. Market? What's Mr. Market telling you by reference to Sterling? Well, Mr. Market is, is uh, always saying that, Ster that Sterling is more valuable if we stay in the European Union or have a soft Brexit and uh, it's less valuable if we leave. And Mr. Mark's going to have to wait because we've run over time. Yeah. Catherine, close and we'll <coughs> let you go. 30 seconds. I, I think to round up and I think really to tie everything together, this is about emotion. The UK has always uh, displayed a lack of emotional and psychological commitment to the EU project. That is still the case. That will continue to be the case. Uh, in relation to Brexit. And that also ties in with the arguments that we've discussed today about e economic insecurity and inequality and austerity. With regards to the second referendum, we are then talking about whether that vote would be binary or non-binary. And that is another big question that is going to face the UK government in the very immediate future, well ahead of 2025. A uh, hopelessly broad uh, question to subject the panellists to. Uh, I think they've done a, a great job in giving us a diverse r range of views and coming over to, to do that. I hope it was valuable. Uh, I certainly would like to thank the panellists for coming and sharing their views. And uh, if you could... Uh, mm -hmm. thank you.